Um, they were rampaging along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. A fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out fine tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week? Or the bottom with six points and second for bottom with five. Yes and no. Yes and no. It paid off for them. They got a two, double the four, one six points. Depends what the teams are bucking for, doesn't it? Welcome to the Bowls Hour, brought to you by Somerset Retirement Villages and Dynasty Apparel. I'm joined by, by my co-host, Alex Reid. Alex, I do first, I've got to apologise for, for last week. I was a, um, a very close contact of a, uh, of a COVID case, and you, you know how compassionate I am towards you and the yes. rest of your crew. Yeah. I didn't want to spread the germs. Um, it seems, though, apparently, that, um, as my kids said to me, COVID doesn't even want to know me. Um, because <laughs> well, we're I've, pleased. I've <laughs> gone through with no symptoms, no nothing. Um, the rats are, are showing nothing, so yeah. there I'm, you go. I'm quite glad that everyone's experiencing the pain of a rat test now, because I don't think it's fair. You know, most people will have had, most of the listeners will have had a rat test. It's a very unpleasant experience. It is. Shoving something Do, well, up your nose and yeah, scraping it around. Apparently, with, with most of them, you don't have to be as, as brutal as the medical professionals are, but yeah. I, I try and make sure I get right in there no. to, to, yeah, we know to some, get any lurgy <laughs> that's, any lurgy that's we, up there. We know some medical professionals at Point Chev Bowling Club, there are some nurses uh, who've got something to do with Auckland Hospital, and I've been informed that if you don't make yourself cry with a rat test, you're doing it wrong. Yep. So that's, uh, yeah. I, I wasn't yeah. a fan of that advice, but it's probably a fair I call. think it's a fair one, but as long as they're not looking, they won't know, will <laughs> they? Now, we're going to get a bit of listener uh, feedback shortly, but I, I want to talk to you about the, the intercentre, because it's, along with everything over the last two years, there's been a lot of disruptions, and you changed the format. Just give us a quick recap on, on what the format was, and let us know what's happened. Yep, happy to do that, Miles. So we were originally going to have a, a national intercentre like we have the last few years, where the 26 centres converge into one area area and play a massive three days and you find a winner of your national intercentre that way but in this current environment we had like 20,000 COVID cases a day it was felt that it was uh, you know virgin on irresponsible to chuck 26 different regions in the same place so this year it's been a regionalised intercentre and we had six regions regions not zones six regions where um, they play off a little round robin and our six regional winners are going to go through to a national final to be held in october in wellington which is really cool um, the only region that didn't play was region three which is manawatu and hawks bay and two other centers and they're playing on the weekend of the 14th of may because it just works better um, for their calendars Do you want so basically that so they're still playing yes but they're just playing at a different time just a than, bit later. than the other ones have yep. gone in there yep. um before we we move on to that. What happened with Canterbury? Because I know a few of those Canterbury bowlers and they were not happy and their top bowlers went off and played for for other or provinces as such in their in their regional things. So why did Canterbury not put a team there? Uh, well, as my understanding is, it was a decision made by the board uh, before the national intercentre, and we had 15 centres pull out of the national intercentre, um, citing uh, COVID reasons, which is absolutely fair enough. So we we uh, created the alternative uh, system of the regional intercentre, which we felt was a bit safer. But the Canterbury board uh, still felt that it was uh, just unsafe. I know, and centres like Hawkes Bay and South Canterbury. Uh, initially said they weren't going to participate in the National Intercentre and then the players spoke to their boards and made their voices pretty well heard and the uh, opinion was changed. So maybe the players didn't talk loud enough to, to the Canterbury it board. It just seems there's always this issue because the, the board do a fantastic job. They do a tough job. You, you've got to administer these the sports. It's not easy and it takes a lot of time and effort. I, I just Can you give us some of the, um, some of the results? I understand um, in, that, that Nelson got a little bit upset they got upset yes yes so in region uh, five the nelson team which had you know some great players in it and would have been favored if you were a bookie which i'm not <laughs> uh, but they would have been favored to win that region but the marlborough men's team uh, came through and won in region five so they'll be going through to the national uh, intercenter final in the same region five the nelson woman who are the defending national intercenter champions from last year uh, came through and won that one and i think they'll be uh, one to look at and speaking of defending champions you might remember the southland men won the national Centre last year. Uh, they uh, came through in Region 6. 
against whoever they were playing against and the woman Central Otago came through in Region 6 and the woman to, to contest the National Centre. Was that a bit of a surprise Central Otago? They're good players uh, but it would be a good one. I imagine they're pretty pleased with that you know they had Dunedin and Southland in that uh, region and they would have been favoured teams I think so Central Otago experienced bowlers but they'll be pleased to have made it through to that next next stage for sure um, if you want to go further up North Miles I played in the regional under centre oh not... you did come on Kirsty okay, we're <laughs> waiting here I, I, I'm waiting it here now the smile on your face there because it sign, indicates eh? to me that, that, that thou were successful yes. put my teeth back in and say <laughs> that again we were, so um, the Auckland men won in Region 1. I got to lead for Mike Galloway instead of um, Martin Dixon, who came down with uh, the Lurgy. Did he? So oh, I, poor uh, old Martin. <laughs> I stepped in for Hope him at the regional. Hope you're right, Martin. Yeah. Hope you're better than your football team anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he's listening, but I stepped into his place uh, for the regional one. They asked me really nicely, and I was happy to How cool to was that? that? Who else was in the side? It just... uh, the force team was uh, Gary Lawson, Jamie Hill, uh, Aidan Takarua, and Nick Thompson. Blind. And I got to lead for Mike, and the singles player was Tony Grantham. So, a pretty good team there. It's when a I go very back, good team. Particularly when I go back into the chat room and Martin comes into my spot in the leading the fears, I think they'll be looking I'll to go. I'll tell you what, though, people won't, a lot of people won't, um, who are listening to this for the first time won't realise what a decent player you are. So, But to play with Mike Galloway must have been a, a thrill. Oh, it was great. I was, I've, I've always wanted a game against him because, uh, or with him, sorry, because I've played enough against him, and often that doesn't end up on the right side of the ledger for me so it was nice to be well, on the well same, done the you same so side. who were the other winners then so who are final winners yeah so region two the men bay of plenty men came through and the woman that was uh thames valley and i think our oh, region four is one we haven't mentioned wellington did a clean sweep men and women both uh both teams got through there to the uh, national descent final if anyone wants sort of a uh, full review of the regional descent just go to our website bowlsnewzealand.co.nz the first tile you see on the website is a full sort of summary of results and there was some live streaming as well which we've got uh, links to. So it's amazing the stuff that's coming out of this place nowadays. I'm very impressed. All right, um, info at bowlsnewzealand.co.nz. Yes. If you want to ask any questions or put a point across or suggest a guest or whatever it might be, info at bowlsnewzealand.co.nz. But I understand yep. that we've had some feedback that you need to address. Yeah, we've had a little bit of feedback. So, you know, I'm still, I spoke to Mark last week and I spoke to you the week before about these rubber greens thing. And I just can't grasp how it worked. <laughs> this is where you had Karen De Jong speak about uh, her father and grandfather put a rubber green down at their bowling club. So there must have been a really popular artificial surface. It just fascinates me that that's something that we actually uh, played on. And Rob Davis spoke about them hardening it and then spray painting it. Green, or green I know. It green. I just, yeah, it was a concept that, that sort of flummoxed me a little bit. I was thinking that, I think I remember mentioning it, that if you drop, you know, if you're one of those droppers yeah. of a bowl, that it could be up. like Barnes Wallace, the dam busters as it goes yeah. towards the other end. So but apparently that wasn't necessarily the case. It was a lot hardened, more compact yeah. than they put some compound on it to harden it. Yeah, so it staggers me. So I'm just interested to hear more about that, really. I know we used to have rubber bowls as well. Dunlop used to make rubber bowls back in the day, Miles. So I just think it's quite interesting. Well, you've got to do something with the off-cuts from the tyres, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, it's good thinking. I mean, uh, that big hole they cut in the middle. Bowls. No, yeah, the, in the tyres. Oh, in the tyres, yeah, yeah. That That's a joke, more, by the way. That makes more sense. I don't want people info at bowlsnewzealand.co.nz <laughs> saying, they don't do the tyres like that. Um, Imagine if they did. <laughs> I, Right now, you you've got your you've got sort of uh, I was going to say your tits in a tangle, but that's a wrong <laughs> expression there. Um, there's a bit of a debate going yes. on about how many points should a draw be worth in, in competition play. Yes. Now um, you're a firm believer that it should be one, like two for a win, yep. one for a draw. Yep. You're not happy. With three for a win, one for a draw. Not, Why is that? Not happy at all, uh, Miles. And to be fair, it's mainly because I think I probably lost out on a ham at some point uh, when I started playing out to bowl. So I come from an indoor background, and in that game, it's two points for a win and one point for a draw because that's half a win. So if you get two draws, it equals a win. And I think I was playing a ham tournament somewhere, and I must have had two wins and two draws, and someone with three wins and a loss uh, beat me on a count back because of the way the system worked. And I just cannot, I don't understand why. Like, where does the third point go to? Does it drift into the into the ether? Into the ether? No, it goes to the winner. 
And if no one wins, no one deserves any extra half, points, so you only deserve one. It's half It's each. there to incentivise people to really go for it rather than try and cling on and play a little, you know, <laughs> sort of lag shot just to just to hold out for the draw. Yeah. Um, I, I think initially I mean, in football they, they changed it. Um, I'm trying to remember now. It'll be about 30 or 40 years ago now. But they changed it to try and incentivise and give greater... Um, impetus and greater value to the to the win to find a winner. Yeah, so you know, I mean, and if 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 you went three and then one and a half, then you're doing exactly the same. There's no greater one. The sort of the mm. difference is, is still the same. Yeah. So, so I'm, look, I'll tell you what we'll do. If we get you a ham, will you feel better about it? I would be. My feelings would be much improved if I if I had a ham. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I know it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting discussion, and clubs and centres all around the place have sort of. Just different uh, rules as to what, how many points, how many game points you get for a win, how many game points you get for a draw. And I'm sort of interested to know what people think because I know I feel pretty strongly. Yeah, that it well, should have, be, you, uh, have you two spoken for a win and one to anyone? I mean, what about in, in the office here, the, the people? Yeah, they've, have we've a had few? a mix, mix of opinions. Um, usually what I'm, does the CEO think? I haven't asked Mark yet. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see. I'll know by the next, uh, next bowls hour what Mark thinks. Uh, but I've had a lot of discussions around bowling clubs whether it should be two or three points. And I'm pretty strong in my opinion, and they're pretty strong in theirs, so we haven't actually come to a, a conclusion uh, yet, Miles. All right, fair enough. Well, let's just get the ham, and we can get that one sorted Good out. I, I can't stand a sulking... Co- How long ago was this ham? Uh, five years ago. Five years... <laughs> Michael, it's been five years already. <laughs> Forget about it. That's an old Vogel's ad that you've probably forgotten by now. It was before your time. Right, next here on the Bowls Hour, we're going to talk to Dale Jackson. Welcome back to the Bowls Hour, brought to you by Somerset Retirement Villages and Dynasty Apparel. And now, Miles, I've got Dale Jackson on the line. So I thought we'll start off with Dale. Uh, can you just give us a little brief snippet of what uh, your background is and who you are to Bowls, please? Yes, thank you. Um, I started life in Pitson uh, with a wonderful family life down there, and sport was a big thing in our family. So we went on and uh, we played lots of different sports and, of course, uh, some of us achieved, some of us didn't, but we were always made to feel important by our parents. And from there, when I was very young, I wanted to become a teacher at the age of five, didn't change my mind. And that sort of led me down a path of where I am today. So a wonderful life so far. So you say that, that you didn't change your mind at five. Do you, do you find yourself changing your mind at all now, or are you still very rigid? <laughs> oh, no, not rigid. That was an absolute dream. I've had other dreams um, along the way. Some have come off, but I've worked out that if you work hard and really follow that dream, any dream can come true. Oh, that's great. What, <laughs> what a good line. That's good, Dale. Um, so... Bowls, how did that come about for you? And how long have you been involved in, in that sport, or our sport, sorry? Um, not very long, really. My first introduction was to bowls when I was very young, going on a bike ride and wondering what on earth was behind the huge grey uh, green hedge in Pitton. And I took off on my bike very quickly because um, I heard such word as kill and hit Jack and I want you to kill this bowl and I really didn't think much of bowls really (laughs) but um, as I got older um, I needed to have a weekend of sport where I wasn't being asked to coach children all the time Um, six days a week with children and coaching and needed it one day at least away from them so I went to bowls and being invited by ex-hockey players to play in a bowlers, non-bowlers day. But um, I said, I've got to have some practice. I just can't turn up. So I had a little bit of information. And since then, I haven't looked back. You mentioned ex-hockey players. Give us a bit of of, of background on on your hockey career, Dale. Uh, I started hockey. Well, my mother was a hockey player, but I didn't. It was just natural. You followed. And uh, my first game was in a little place called Two Marina. And we lost 13 nil because we really didn't have too many skills. But the morning tea was wonderful, so I kept going, <laughs> thinking this was quite good. 
But from then on, it just went on naturally. I came through the age group rep programs, uh, representing Marlborough, representing Wellington, went on um, and uh, kept going. I got to New Zealand level. It's just a wonderful sport. Uh, how did the umpiring thing happen with bowls? So you play bowls, you coach bowls. What got you into the umpiring side of things? Well, as children, um, we spent a lot of time with our parents going over the rules and the laws at our own level um, around the Saturday table, if you like. And it became an important issue to know the laws or the rules of any sport we were involved in. So when I got to bowls, there seemed to be so many laws I got called. I thought it was rather strange to call them laws. Um, and thought, how does one find out about this? They gave me a law book, and it read like the Bible, thou shalt not. <laughs> so I said, where do you get clarification? And I went to the umpires to learn. So I got what I wanted, and I said, right, that's it, thank you. And they said, no, no, you've got to stay and do... Um, the measuring, okay, that'll be useful. So I stayed and did that. And then they said, right, well, now we want you to go out to be an umpire. Um, and I thought, no, that's not what I wanted to do. But <laughs> I did it and then discovered that I could stand right behind the heads, watch the heads, listen to the skips, and so on. So it just sort of grew from there. And I actually enjoy umpiring still today, very much so. How on that, one thing that gets me, Dale, is, is, is in the measuring. You mentioned the measuring. And I, I'd start shaking. And I'd think that I'd be knocking a bowl or doing it. I mean, and people are going to get very irate if, if you make any mistake. <laughs> do, do you get nervous down there or how do you keep a steady hand? I think it's just practice and focus on, and that's the key word in most sports, focus on the point at hand. And you seem to be able to do it very well or as well as it's needed and um, get a result. And that's all the players want. And they want you to do that quickly and very, very, um, being very precise. Yeah, that's a good sales pitch to be an umpire as well. I hadn't considered the fact that it's actually like uh, probably the best seat in the house you can get when you're watching the game, isn't it, Dale? Oh, it certainly is. I mean, you tell other people to be quiet and move back, but I can stand there. And, uh, <laughs> so you've got to get the best out of whatever situation you're in. Um, if you don't do something that you like, don't do it. But if you like it, enjoy it. How have you found the coaching uh, side of bowls in comparison to other sports that you've been a part of? Um, there's a similarity um, I got into coaching, I think, probably because wanting to be a teacher, it's a natural flow on that you want to help people. And um, I enjoy working. I work with secondary school students, primary school students, uh, right through to, luckily and very successfully this weekend, winning the regional uh, group with the senior, Wellington Rep. So um, it's just working with people, and I enjoy that. That's great, and it is. Uh, so uh, sort of uh, another bowlsy question. So you coach bowls, you umpire bowls. Do you find much time to, to play the sport? Yes, I play. I'm in, uh, fortunate enough to be in our um, club team, which is Miramar, and uh, we've, uh, I've won a centre title. Uh, not a centre. I have won a centre title, but I've won a Miramar title this year. That's great, and it's a good sport, isn't it? Because, I mean, anyone can sort of... Anyone can play bowls. <laughs> Sometimes with the corporate groups, you've got to remind them it's not 10 pin bowling and uh, just let them. And they had success in the end because uh, they've learnt that it's a new skill, a new game, and it's good. And those people will come into bowls later in life. So it's important we keep up these corporate groups. Yeah. Yeah, it not being tempin's a good call. <laughs> yeah, very good call. Uh, uh, as, uh, what you say there, Dale, it, it's it struck me because I, I've only been involved here for about four or five years now, um, just helping out various bits and pieces. But I just found it when you watch it a lot and you see top players playing, absolutely entrancing almost. The the the, the way that the bowl moves so relatively slowly down the arena and, and makes its way up there. It, it's just it's something hypnotising about it. Yes, I think it is. And I think it's a challenge. Um, and I like challenges. And most people, 
even though they mightn't admit admit it, they do like challenges in life. And bowls gives you that sense of achievement, sense of frustration, <laughs> the sense of joy, and the sense of absolute, I'm giving this game away, but you can't give it away because it's enticing you. And I think that's just what grabs people at the low level or the top level. I'm going to have and, to write um, down some of the stuff you're saying, Dale. It's just... <laughs> That's great. Sales pitch. <laughs> um, so the, the last sort of thing I wanted to pose, and we've had a, a debate in the office for some time here at Bowls New Zealand. Um, in New Zealand, we have something called a mouse trap, which I presume most people know when I say I'm going to make a mouse trap to eat. Uh, what does that mean to you? What do you think a mouse trap is? Um, a mouse trap to me literally is catching those little creatures that are a jolly nuisance to everybody. So you, you wouldn't eat um, it. <laughs> but then you come up to where once you're caught in a mouse trap, you've got to make sure that you can sort of get out of it and start looking outwards right. rather than just being caught in. One so this is a philosophical thing. He, a, he was hoping you were going to say, you get some bread, yeah. and then you put some Marmite on it, and then oh. some cheese over the top with some mustard. Yeah. Well, that's what I think a mousetrap is, but some people in the office think that it's spaghetti and cheese miles, and that's not acceptable to I, I actually like Dale's version of it. I think that's... This has been a philosophy... You don't teach philosophy, do you? It's going to be... Ha- <laughs> No, well, you do, right, from the word go, but you've got to make sure the children, because I was the principal for a long time, um, you've got to make sure that they're enjoying themselves as well as the teachers, and uh, you've got to come up with some quite crazy <laughs> ideas at times, but it works. That's great. <laughs> Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much in, indeed for your time, Dale. Well done on the uh, on the Miramar title. It's a lovely part of, of the capital city out there. So well done on that. I'm sure we're going to hear more of you. And well done on the, on the Wellington um, crew doing their business with the senior side as well. We wish you all the best in your bowls career and your teaching and your hockey coaching. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dale. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye. That was fascinating. I like there, but you can tell the teacher bit in there from Dale, can't yeah. you? You know the thing. There's always there was a lesson there. I mean, you were there. you were taking notes down oh, there. It's you, brilliant. The number of lines you're just, you could I'll use. I tell you what, you're going to be teacher's pet, aren't you? The way you're writing stuff down oh, there. I didn't and, get many detentions in school, Miles. Uh, I, so. uh, do you know something that doesn't Hard to bleed, believe? <laughs> that doesn't surprise me? No, it doesn't surprise me. I've seen the way you behave around the CEO, <laughs> so I know what you'd have been like, like with uh, with teacher. Right. We have got oh, a couple of great guests still to come, but stay tuned. We're going to hear from one of our parajacks, Sue Curran, here on the Bowls Hour. Welcome back to the Bowls Hour, brought to you by Somerset Retirement Villages and Dynasty Apparel. And on the line now, I have Sue Curran. So, Sue, for uh, Joe Boggs bowler out there who might have missed the publicity about being named in the uh, para team to go to the Commonwealth Games, could you just give us a quick sort of overview um, of who you are to bowls, please? I am a vision impaired bowler who started bowling when I, when I lost my vision. I'm not totally blind, but I do have very low vision. Um, I took it up. I actually took up indoor bowls to start with here at the Hamilton Blind Indoor Bowls, and found out by getting my certificate with them for their nationals that I also qualified for lawn bowls blind nationals. So um, yeah, it was a nice two-way road for me, really. That's great. I've um, on a quick side note, the indoor. Uh Blind Nationals uh, was in Auckland a couple of years ago, and I went down to watch and ended up being a, um, what do you call the, a guide. I got to be a guide, a guide for one of the people. It was a fantastic oh, event. It was great. And you were quite successful, weren't you? Uh, yes, I, uh, I helped to win the women's singles. I've got a little, <laughs> it's my national title. <laughs> well done. Yeah, it's a fantastic, well it's a great event, and just incredible um, bowlers. I didn't know that. That's yes. interesting. Well, my first year at the Blind Indoor Nationals, I won the women's ladies title. Amazing. And I had that, had that title for, I don't know, it was either three or four years. I was either winner or runner-up for three or four years, and then I gave it away because of the outdoor bowls. Mm. So, do you mind me asking, Sue? How, how did you? Um, how did your vision become impaired? I've got what they call retinitis pigmentosa, or RP, 
to put it short. I've had bad vision probably since I was about eight. Um, I think the school teacher must have rang my mother or something and said she can't read anything. So I was taken to the optician about, at that stage, it was only short-sightedness. And I do remember saying to my mother, I was going to wear my glasses at the weekend, but I was not going to wear them to school. (laughs) Um, Of course, Monday morning, off I go to school with my glasses on. Um, But I I had bad vision right through my life. But this retina dysfunction, if you like to call it, developed probably early 90s, I was told I would go blind. Um, Well, I'm blind in one eye and half blind in the other, (laughs) I suppose. (laughs) But you're still but battling. I've still got, I'm still battling, and I still have a little sight, which I am so grateful for. Now, wh- why bulbs? What, what, what suddenly, you know, when, you, when your sight's going, and what, what was it that drew you to bowls? A friend of mine at the time here, Christine Foster, who's now an umpire from New Zealand, she took me for a have-a-go day at the outdoor bowls. I sort of threw a few up, I don't know that I bowled very well, but she entered me into the Nationals, uh, 2011 Nationals at, Blind Nationals at Browns Bay. And I sort of quite got into it from there, but my stepfather, late late stepfather, he wanted me to play lawn bowls for a long time and I just could not understand why anybody would stand out in the heat of the day, all day, (laughs) playing bowls. And I we had some quite heated discussions over this. <laughs> <laughs> so, and unfortunately, he's never got to see my journey. He passed away just after I'd started playing, so he never got to see the journey that I'm on, which is very sad, but yeah. And you've had an incredible journey as well, uh, <sighs> so, and, and quite a, you know, it's a meteoric rise. Can you just talk us through, like, how did it feel the first time you were represented to, to play for your, your country? Well, the first time was 2013. I was selected after only playing for just over 12 months for the Blind World Bowls Championships in Worthing in England and ended up winning the silver medal. Um, I will say I beat Australia. (laughs) Um, In my very first game. (laughs) And um, I also won a bronze medal in that um, World Championship. And that was 2013. And... 2014 was the first time I was actually part of the Blackjacks section, sorry, um, with the Trans-Tasman over in Melbourne and then got the phone call from Peter Ballas to say that I was in the main team for the Glasgow Commonwealth Games, and which was absolutely incredible. And that was 2014. So I'd only been playing a couple of years then. Incredible experience. Yeah, it would be. It would be amazing. And very recently, you've been uh, named to represent New Zealand again at the Commonwealth Games, uh, coming up a bit later on this year. How did that yeah. feel? And when did you find out? We found out um, the announcement was made last Tuesday. That my third go at the Commonwealth Games. I played on the Gold Coast as well in 2018. But at, I am of an age where I should be totally retired. Um, but I actually didn't take up bowling until I'd retired. So, um, yes, I'm probably getting near and fairly close to the end of my um, international bowling career, if you like to put it that way. But, um, no, I was, I'm absolutely delighted to, to be given the opportunity to have one more go at a medal at the Commonwealth Games. And I have a different pairs partner this time. So I'm hoping that we will succeed. What, what's um, what's it like playing on the, those slower greens? You would have played on them in, in Glasgow, which will probably hold you in mm. good stead. Um, how hard is it to, do you find it to adapt? Um, a lot harder as you get older, obviously, but um, they are hard. They are hard. There's no two ways about that. Um, I think the New Zealand greens are obviously very, very fast, but to go over to slow greens, I'm practising on a croaky green here in Hamilton and um, they've been very, very supportive of have us allowing allowing us to go down and have practices whenever we want. But it is it is tricky because you don't get the draw of the bowl that you do on a fast screen. There's very little draw. Um, initially you're sort of throwing them down and hoping they'll get there. <laughs> the um, 
you certainly need some a bit more strength in the arms to get the distance because they also go to 40 metres, which is 36 metres playing distance, um, whereas most of ours start off at 33, 34 metres. Um, so they're much longer green as well, so they are extremely heavy greens. Do you have a, do you have a guide, um, Sue? Yes. yes. I have a, a, what they call a director for outdoor bowls. Yep. And she is virtually, it's Bronwyn Milne's time. I've been very, very fortunate to have Anne Muir for some years and chose to stand down this year for personal reasons. So I've got a friend here in Hamilton who's been helping me, Bronwyn Milne, and Bronwyn is my eyes. So she will let me know how short or how long I am, um, how wide, where the jack is, where my bowls finish up on the clock system, um, whether they're 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Um, so she is virtually my eyes. Um, they do not like blind bowlers going onto the rinks without a guide or director for safety reasons mm-hmm. with the ditches and things there. Um, so be, be one up to be three. You're supposed to have a director with you at all times. So when you um, play internationally, uh, Sue, and they, your mm-hmm. position has guides, do they use the same systems that we use in New Zealand? So you, you talk about the clock system, and I remember being taught that when I went to the indoor uh, nationals, there was a clock mm-hmm. system, and I think the length they were between 15 and 20 in the North Island, and then the South Island have some other weird <laughs> way to decide <laughs> how many feet up a bowl is. Is it the same for the overseas yes. people? It is, except the directors overseas, a lot of the directors will direct from out the front of a player, whereas I prefer my director to stand behind me, <laughs> probably for her safety reasons. <laughs> um, but, yes, they, it, the system, the clock system is the same universal with the blind. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good idea. That makes sense. Okay, mm. I've got I've got one more question uh, for you, Sue, and we've asked this already of Dale. And I think, uh, based on the answer I got from Dale, I should first stipulate that this is a food related question. But we have a <laughs> um, we've got a debate happening in the office about what constitutes a mouse trap. Do you have an opinion? I, I do. Well, my understanding, especially as I love savoury food, probably more so than sweet. Um, I think it's bit of toast with some bacon and some cheese um, and grilled or something like that. I think that's the old mouse trap. Yours is quite exotic, bunging the bacon in there, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, yeah, on a pension, you can't afford that. But just, <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> but the, um, no, the, the, you know, the taste of it sounds quite nice, actually. Yeah. But I'm sure, I'm sure it's got bacon in it and... Um, yeah, bit of cheese and you know well, pasta lips and on the hips. Yeah. <laughs> that's a third option because uh, the, in the office we're arguing whether it's spaghetti and cheese on toast or marmite okay. and cheese on toast is the argument here. And now we have a third one which is with bacon with bacon mm. as well. That actually sounds better than both of those. It, it does. I think I'm oh, going round to Sue's for, for <laughs> when, when the mouse traps are, are coming out. Sue Curran, okay. thank you, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed our, our chat. We wish you all the best at the Commonwealth Games, and oh. hey, fingers crossed you come back with a, a nice gold shiny one. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you. It's been a lot of fun. Um, Sue, we will do our best. Thank you. Sue Curran there from the uh, Parajacks. Uh, yeah, Birmingham, representing uh, the Blackjacks, representing New Zealand at the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham later on this year. And with a great recipe for mousetrap. You can find that on our website. No, you can't. You can't. You can just make it up yourself. Right. Next, we're going to talk to a, a gentleman who's also in the Parajacks, but is also a chess Grandmaster Mark Noble up next. Welcome back to the Bowls Hour, brought to you by Somerset Retirement Villages and Dynasty Apparel. And we've gone from one pair of jack to another now, Miles. I've got Mark Noble on the line. How are you, Mark? Um, good, thanks, uh, Alex and Miles. That's great. We just uh, we're just having a chat to uh, Sue Curran before we moved on to you. So I suppose on that uh, on that line, uh, can you just talk a bit about how it felt to be named in the Commonwealth Games team to go to wherever it is, Birmingham, isn't it? Ah, uh, yeah, it's Birmingham. Um, clearly, you always want to be selected for your um, your um, nation, and um, this is another great opportunity uh, for me. I'm lucky enough to go on to two. 
um, in Glasgow and then Gold Coast. Um, so a chance to um, maybe set the record straight and kick you to goals this time. <laughs> Fair enough. That sounds like a great plan. Um, so you've been around bowls for you know, more than a little while. Could you just take us back to the beginning? How did you get into, into bowls? How did it start? Um, I guess the main reason that it started was my accident that I had um, when I was 13, um, where I was actually quite active runner and and was playing rugby um, for Petone. Um And I think I was like a couple of grades up on my age because I was very, very fast at running back in those days. And after my accident, clearly I couldn't play any more sports other than um, lawn bowls where both my parents played at a bowling club called Central in Batoni. Um, and I actually joined the Tony Bowling Club, which was just down the road, due to they having age restrictions back in those days. If you were under 18, you couldn't go onto the premises because of the licence issues. So you joined up there and just sort of, did you take to it like a duck to water or did it take a bit of practice? Certainly I played indoor bowls prior to that and was reasonable indoor bowler back in those days as well. I played for um, the Hutt Valley represented side in Patterson and all sorts of things as well. So, so I had some clues on taking green and some weight control, but <laughs> I was never really, never really that good back then, but I could get better as my years went on. Uh, Mark, one thing that's blown me away is, is watching the Parajacks is, A, how competitive you are with able-bodied people, but also the v- massive range of, of, of different sort of um, disabilities that people have had that have gone into that. I mean... It, is bowls? Do you think bowls is unique as far as that goes? Oh, I think bowls has to be unique. It's a level playing field. Uh, not very often we get to play like the world champion. Good chance to play people like Shannon or Gary Lawson. And when you get those opportunities to play them, um, we can actually still beat them. Uh, they're not scary on the green for us. And I think that's one of the, the key things um, as a player. Just get out there and do the job. Absolutely. And you had a, um, I mean, you're a, a very competitive uh, bowler anyway, Mark, at the um, open level you play in your, uh, the top seven for uh, Manawa 2. Uh, so the para bowls journey or thing, how did that happen? Did, when did you discover it? Uh, have you always played in para bowls or was it someone, did someone tap you on the shoulder? I know Graham Scalurn didn't play um, para bowls for a while. He was um, telling someone <laughs> the other day. How did it start for you? Um, so... Back in 2003, um, the, the Paradrack team um, went to uh, Manchester and they ended up getting sent home for a player um, misbehaving. And the two players that were left in that side was Peter Horn and Barry Winks. Um, now, Peter, who I knew really good in Wellington, and I've known him for, since we were kids as well, he convinced me to try and play para bowls. I, I was pretty much convinced uh, that I had nothing wrong with me and I wouldn't be eligible, but he convinced me to go along and do the test. Um, and so there we were, 2003, going in and do the test, and it came out that I was a B6, which is um, the most most disabled out of the B6, B8 category. Um, and, of course, funny thing about it is Peter's got no hands and no feet, um, but he's only a B7. <laughs> and, and I still don't understand any of that but I guess the main point for me I was eligible and and I did participate in the 2003 World Championship in Christchurch where me and Peter and Barry won a uh, gold medal in the triples and me and Peter and the peers got a bronze so it was my first um, time playing at that sort of in, in the para um, arena that's amazing. It's sort of been from step to step there. And the last uh, few Commonwealth Games, do you wanna do you wanna talk us through how they went? You had a lot of success, but it wasn't you know you didn't quite get the uh, the shade of of co- metal colour that you were looking for. Can you just talk us through what happened in those? Um, like I think the first Com Games was Glasgow with Linda Bennett and Barry Winks. We we started off with a Trans Tasman in Australia, where on day one we weren't very good, and we'd lost. The first uh, three games, actually, we'd lost two and drawn one. And then we went on a run of 19 consecutive games winning um, in a row before we had a draw with South Africa in section play at the 
Glasgow Games. Um, and then we had to replay South Africa in the final where we actually lost on the very last bowl of the game. So we'd actually had something like 21 consecutive games without actually losing, which in any international arena is, is pretty much up there. It is. I don't think a lot of people would know. And then the uh, the next Commonwealth Games, what happened there? What happened in that in that uh, edition? Um, that, that was a, a lot different. So we had Bruce Wakefield with me and Barry Winks in, in that event. Um, we'd actually lost to Australia more times than we'd beaten them all the way through. We'd been over for Trans Tasman. They'd given us a bit of a tickle up. They, we, they beat us in section plays. But they looked better than us in terms of us playing them each game. But when we played the final, we, we just sort of dug in. We got a, a fair way behind early on. We got a nice five to get back in the game. And then we actually led with a couple of ends to play. And, and on the last end, we were still leading. And Ken Hansen from Australia played um, an absolute bomb, to be fair. And then on his last bowl, he drew the winning shot to take once again the gold away from us on the last bowl. So uh, two times, two com games and two last bowl losses. I guess next one I'm going to have last bowl. <laughs> oh, I tell you, well, this is this is the way it's going to be, Mark. And I'm telling you, mate, you're coming back with gold, or you're not coming back at all. <laughs> <laughs> now, Beautiful. Mark, um, I mentioned um, when we were sort of introing you uh, before before you joined us um, that you're a chess grandmaster uh, as well. Uh, tell us uh, uh, about that. So, um, I guess in our chess history, we've had two chess grandmasters. One is as we would call face to face at tournaments, which is Murray Chandler, and myself, which is for in the old days we used to do uh, mail, so slow mail. You play a move, um, you get a letter back in three months' time, and you, a game would take ten, twelve years. I guess for me, it's like like any other sport. We are the elite of the elite in our sport, mm. and New Zealand still has had no other correspondence grandmasters, so. I'm, I'm still it, I guess. How do you go on the non-correspondence one, like face to face to face? So I remember Gary Lawson mouthing off that he could beat <laughs> you, and, and 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 he ran with his tail between his legs. How, how do you go on that? And have you got ambitions to try and reach that sort of level on face to face chess? Uh, back in the days when I was doing it, I wasn't playing as many bowls as I would normally, so I was playing more chess tournaments than bowls tournaments. And then uh, once once I got married and had a son, something had to be hit on the head, so it was the chest that went and the lawn bowl stayed. Fair. Well, we're pleased that you decided to do that, Mark. <laughs> That's a good decision. So we've got uh, one last question for you, and again, I'll preclude it by the fact that it's definitely a food question that we're going to ask. But my question is, when we say, you know, I'm going to make a mouse trap to eat, what do you think goes in the mouse trap? Um, for me... It would be cheese and eggs on bread. What? Eggs? Yeah. Oh, this is fascinating. We had Sue Curran (laughs) putting bacon in there. Erin Nurka put put spaghetti into it. And now you're bunging eggs in. Yeah, eggs eggs and cheese on toast. Beautiful, mate. Oh, so I mean, it sounds delicious. But, oh, that, this is there's all nothing. this exotic. See, we thought this was going to be a nice, simple question. Everyone would say it's marmite with cheese on top and maybe a bit of mustard. Yeah. But no, we've had all these different varieties. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't like marmite. All geeky mites. Well, that's fa- that's fair enough. Mark Noble, thank you so much for for joining us. I really appreciate it, and um, I, I feel confident you guys are, are going to come back with the medal that you desire. All the best, and look forward to talking to you when you return. Yeah, thanks for that, Miles and uh, Alex. Um, been great chatting. Thanks, Mark. Mark Noble there, who uh, member of the Parajets, yeah, going for his uh, third limb. And I'll tell you what. I'm looking forward to going home and putting in egg, spaghetti, bacon and everything else <laughs> on a piece of toast and calling it a mouse trap. Ridiculous. I'm actually, I'm keen. You know, you know, if listeners want to tell us what they think a mouse trap makes, exactly. that's what we mean by listener feedback. Info it, at bowlsnewzealand.co.nz. Feedback, yeah, that's good. See, nice little good pun, pun you did eh, there, yeah. yeah. Info at bowlsnewzealand.co.nz. That's info at bowlsnewzealand.co.nz. Any comments, any questions, any opinions you want to chuck in there or any guests that you think would be worthy of us chatting to here on The Bowls Hour. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of The Bowls Hour. This is the show for all things 
bowls. Don't forget, share this podcast far and wide. You can find us here every week on SENZ or SENZ if you prefer from 8pm on a Wednesday um, as well as Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, Facebook. Oh blimey, it goes on. There's loads of places, isn't it? And of course, the Bowls New Zealand website. We're everywhere. Tune in next week for more scintillating conversation. Until then, roll on. Um, they were rampaged along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. A fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out fine tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week? Or in the bottom with six points and seven for bottom with throw? Yes and no. Yes and no. It paid off for them. They got a two, double the four, and one six points. Depends what the team's above you do, doesn't it? The Bowls Hour, brought to you by Somerset Retirement Villages and Dynasty Apparel.